So who needs some peace today? Just raise your hand if you want a little bit of peace today. You say, that's me. Who had some peace and lost it? You know what I mean? Who has some peace but wants some more? Wherever you find yourself today, I really think it's true. It goes without saying that every single one of us, wherever we're coming from, whatever we're dealing with, we could use some peace and we'll do whatever it takes to find it. The problem is that many of us don't know where to go for peace. We don't know what to do to get peace. And we don't know where our peace even went if we felt like we had it at some point, or we don't know how to increase and get more of it. We want peace in our income to expense ratio, don't we? We want peace in our relationships. We want peace in our workplace, and we want a peaceful home. But most of all, we want peace where it counts most inside the ramblings of our own heart and our own mind. And man, isn't that the hardest kind of peace to get and keep? If we're honest, this is so challenging for us on a daily basis And that's exactly the problem we're going to tackle with the Lord today. Are you ready? But let me tell you something. Here's the problem. If we gain some information today, if we gain a new tactic, some new uh, revelation, that doesn't necessarily give us any more peace. That's only going to happen if we decide with Jesus' help to apply what we learn to our life. So I want to ask you, who along with myself want to apply some of God's teaching on peace to your life? I know I do. So let's ask the God of peace to do exactly that today. Wherever you're at, would you join me in prayer? Holy Spirit, you are in this place. And you, self-proclaimed, are the God of peace. We worship you. We love you. We pursue you wholeheartedly as much as our hearts can today, God, because we want some of your peace. And we want not just peace from you, but we want to have peace with you. Would you extend this revolutionary trait to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, welcome to Travelers Church, wherever you're at. If you're in the room, we're so thankful. Uh, I love uh, just getting responses from you as, as uh, we preach and, and hear and learn together. But if you're online and however you join us, we're glad that you took the time to do so. And that we'd love to hear about your journey with Jesus and know how we can encourage you. One of the ways we might be able to do that, I say it every week, but this is our very favorite thing to give away, copies of God's Word. And we have these beautiful new uh, reference Bibles that have come in. Some people so graciously gave us that we could give to you and provided that. We love to put one of these in your hand. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version today, but there's a lot of good translations of the Bible. That's just the one we'll be using. So let us know. If you want one, we've got them right here in the back, and one of my friends will bring them. If you're online, let us know. We'll drop one right to your door. Last week I started out in John 14, verse 26, and it goes like this. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So turn with me to John chapter 14. This next verse will be on the screen because we'll go through it uh, here in just a second. But John chapter 14 is where we'll be today. This last verse I left off on purpose last week so we could resume on this next verse. We're in a series called Be Still and Know, and today is the peace we need. John chapter 14 is an amazing passage because this iconic verse on peace is wedged in this precise location, I believe, for an amazing uh, application piece for us this morning. And so we pick off Uh, We pick up where we left off, verse 27 now here on the screen, and it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So how do we understand and apply this to our life? This verse sure sounds really good, but what does it mean and how do we actually get down into applying it to our life? I want to offer a little bit of context so we can understand why in the world Jesus would have said these words at precisely this moment. So today we're going to examine three levels of peace. You may find that you haven't really thought of these like this uh, before. And to be honest with you, in my study this week, 
I, I don't think I saw this until I really dug in and saw, wow, there's some, there's some type of progression of peace here. There's a leveling up. And so church, I believe we're probably somewhere in this, or, or maybe on zero before we hit one. Say, so I don't have any peace at all. But we're somewhere on this uh, hierarchy of peace, this level of peace. And I believe God wants to upgrade each of us this morning. He wants you to have peace. He's not trying to keep it from you. He wants you to be full of peace. And so we want to level up in his definition of peace that we'll see in John chapter 14. See, these three areas are the promise of peace, the practice of peace, and the purpose of peace. And I want to walk us through exactly why I believe God would put it like this in his word. This first level of peace, it's the one that everybody wants. When somebody says, yeah, I don't have any peace, or I really want some peace, this is what they're talking about. It's the promise of peace. And you might find a little bit of peace apart from God, but it will never last. It's not the same type of peace that the world gives Jesus says when he gives you peace. When you get some peace from Jesus, this is revolutionary to your life, and it is sustaining. It is supernatural. It's a peace that no one else can take away. But this first level of peace is very much when we feel peace. Say, I'm feeling peace right now. And so it denotes a restful, calm, relaxed, and positive state of being. I hope you want some of that just hearing it. This is the promise of peace. Here are some supporting scriptures that might help you understand this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, we're instructed to cast all our anxiety on him because he cares for you. Matthew chapter eleven twenty eight, 28, such a famous verse. Come to me, all who labor, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Psalm 29, 11, may the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. God wants to give you peace today. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Excuse me, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. This fruit of the Spirit comes through the indwelling presence of Jesus. All these verses are promised us upon salvation, upon the initiation of relationship with Jesus, upon responding to his offering of grace into our lives, and we shall receive this peace. This is a promise, church. But this is not the ending. This is the beginning of peace. First, I want to tell you this morning that the promise of peace is in the presence of Jesus as our Savior. When we have Jesus as our Savior, there is inevitably a new kind of peace in your heart. You feel it and you know it and other people see it. It doesn't mean you're you're perfect all the time. It doesn't mean you never have anxiety again. It doesn't mean that you never worry. But it means that your life is driven and defined by a new peace from God. So as we look in John chapter 14... Pastor West, where are you getting this from? Right in verse 1. <coughs> now, John, the Gospel of John was written by the disciple John who walked with Jesus for three years. It says uh, that in his Gospel, he himself wrote the purpose of his book. Some of you might remember it. He says, I am writing these things so that, any of you remember? I'm writing these things so that you may, that's right, so that you may believe. I'm writing these things so that you may believe. And later in the book, he says, so that you may believe and have life in his name. And I want you to remember the purpose of his gospel when you look at verse 1 of chapter 14. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. The same in our core verse today, verse 27. We're going to have peace. His solution to not letting your hearts be troubled is to believe in God. And to believe also in me, Jesus speaking here. Believe in God, believe in the Son, Jesus, and you will not have troubled hearts. This is so contrary. We think we need to change our circumstances in order to have peace. You see, this thing is disrupting my peace. Let me fix it so I can have peace. And Jesus' solution to our unpeaceful lives is actually belief. If we'll choose to believe in him, we'll have peace. And I know it's hard, church. I know some aspects of our faith, they're hard to walk out. They're hard to believe. And when it gets down to the nitty-gritty of walking with God, it's not always easy. But the solution God offers to you and to me this morning is that if we will believe, we will be filled with peace. Aren't you glad? And in verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except 
through me. So here's the thing. When you talk about believing in God, we can't just believe, uh, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. We can't just believe, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. We have to believe in this. We have to believe the way God says we must believe. And in the beginning of John 14, Jesus makes one of his famous I am statements seven times through the gospel of John. He says, I am, identifying himself with the Old Testament revelation of the name of God, and also defining his character as a permanent identity level character that we can count on. He says, I am the way, not a way, the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, no one can get to the Father without him. We call this a claim of exclusivity. Many people today believe there are a lot of ways to make it to heaven. And people make it, people that believe this, they're absolutely welcome. I want you to know it. They're absolutely welcome to journey with us here at Traveler's Church. It's no problem, whatever people believe today, to be a part of journeying with Jesus here. We are glad. But we will stand up for the truth. These are the words of Jesus, and we cannot ignore what he has said. That's why we ought to be out sharing our faith all the time, because if this is true, there's a lot of people heading in the wrong direction today. It may be true that Jesus is wrong and that there's many ways to heaven. I don't think so. But what we can't do, we can't lump Jesus in with any number of other belief systems because he himself disagrees. Jesus will not be one God on a shelf of options. He won't fit inside of your always lead to heaven mentality. He's not part of a religious potluck where you pick and choose what is convenient for you on a given day. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And John says that the reason we don't have peace is because we don't believe him. If we believed Jesus and put all our eggs in one basket, put all our faith in one man, put all of our belief in the one God-man, Jesus, we will have peace. It's a promise. I hope you want some. I want to offer one secondary text today. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> What an amazing verse. We've been justified, a courtroom terminology. That once and for all, the judge declares us not guilty, even though we are guilty. Really what he has said is Jesus has already paid the penalty, therefore you're not going to have to serve the time. It's already been done. Because we are justified in an instant by faith, we automatically have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So how do we get this and how do we feel this? We gain the promise of peace by resting in Jesus as our Savior. Church, are you resting in Him today? Are you resting in Jesus as your Savior? We're going to look at three roles Jesus has in our life. And this is the first one. We need to rest in Jesus as our Savior. You see, as Savior, Christ removes our angst and exchanges it for peace. In other words, if you have Jesus, you have peace. And if you don't, you can have Jesus and peace today. We'll talk about it at the end of this time. So as we level up, we're going to look at a second level of peace today. We want this promise of peace automatic through faith and belief in Jesus. This second level is one that those with what I'm going to call temporary peace they really want this, but they don't know how to make the sacrifice to get it. Because this kind of peace does cost us something more. It's going to cost all of us something more to attain this second level of peace. This kind of peace is seen in steadiness, consistency, discipline, confidence, and inner satisfaction. So I want to offer some examples of this kind of peace. Isaiah 26, verse 3, you keep him in perfect peace. Don't miss this whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. It costs us something. Our mind must be stayed on God, and if so, we will be kept in perfect peace. Psalm 119, 165, that's a lot of verses in one chapter. It says, great peace have those, don't miss it, who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. But I wonder how much do we really love God's law, his rules, his decrees, his order, 
that's supposed to be in our lives. See, if we'll order our lives the way God wants us to and love what he's told us to do, we will have peace. And if not, the alternative is also true. (coughs) Isaiah 32, verse 17, and the effect of righteousness, the result, the conclusion, will be peace. The result of righteousness, quietness, and trust forever. What a beautiful verse is in that church. But we've got to live differently, don't we? You see, sometimes the reason we don't have peace is because we're making a mess of our lives. And God says, my son, my daughter, what are you doing? I've created you for a specific way of living and I've given you peace so that you continue. And the reason you're so troubled today is because you haven't been walking the way I've asked you to. The solution is simple. Walk in the righteousness of God. And hey, we all mess up, don't we? So repent quickly and get back on track. There's grace for all of us in this. And there's peace ready for us. So secondly today, the practice of peace comes from listening to Jesus as our Lord. Somebody say, Lord. Mm. We've got to listen to Jesus as Lord. We want to rest in him as Savior, but we've got to listen to him as our Lord. And don't forget, like we talked about last week, hearing and listening are not the same thing. They're not the same thing, are they? Hearing and listening. Mama always said, you're hearing me. I'm not sure you're listening. They're not the same thing. And so this level requires something of us beyond simply trusting God. Rather, we will have peace, not just if we take our burdens to God, but also if we do what he says. And we look in our primary passage today, John 14. This is what it says in verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments A few verses later in 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And then in verse 23, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. That's where peace comes from. We've got to love God and do what he says, and then he will come and make his home with us. Jesus tells his followers to keep his commandments, and it's no coincidence, church. If you feel like you're having trouble with that, we understand. I understand. We all do. And so the very next thing Jesus says after verse 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But then in 16, Jesus says, there's no way they're going to be able to follow what I said. They're going to mess it all up. So what am I going to do? I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Praise God that he did not leave us alone with his commandment to live righteously. He didn't leave us alone, say, follow everything I told you guys to do. But then he provided a solution for us to do it. We have to recognize the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and his effect and influence in our lives. So summing this second point up, we gain the practice of peace by listening to Jesus as our Lord. Are you listening? Are your spiritual ears tuned to what God is asking you to do today? I sure hope so. I sure hope so because that's where peace comes in. As Lord, Christ rules our thoughts and actions, resulting in peace. If it was left up to us, we would make a mess of our life, and we would make a mess of our peace. So in other words, if Jesus rules, his peace gets into all of us every day. If he rules, his peace gets into all of us every day. We've got to listen to him as Lord. But this third level of peace, it's one that I think many rarely consider, And as I was studying this week, I was contemplating this level of peace because of why was Jesus saying these things at this particular point with his disciples? Why right now? What's so significant about this moment? This is the pinnacle of God's definition of peace. This peace contains a sense of discontent. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. Discontent and peace don't go together. I think they actually do. It's this discontent that hones a person's inner peace while at the same time prompting them to extend peace to others. The discontent is that there is not peace everywhere. 
You see, God, the God of peace, wants peace everywhere. He wants peace in me. He wants peace in you. He wants peace in you. He wants peace in your friends, in your neighbors, in your coworkers, in your families, in your hearts. And a person with God's peace is unsatisfied until there is peace everywhere. So we can walk, it, walk in peace and be at peace, but still have a discontent because we want to see peace extended. The mission Jesus sent us into is challenging. No doubt he knew we would need a bolstering peace inside of us. And it may very well be the reason many of us find peace so challengingly challenging to consistently walk in is because we might not be as engaged in the mission Jesus wants us to be. <laughs> it's in following him into mission. We gain his perfect peace. This level of peace is defined by assured faith, burning passion, bold witness, and divine purpose. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 explains this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. God loves it when we go and make peace. Daniel chapter 10, in verse 8, he's having this crazy vision. And so he says he was left all alone and saw this great vision, and there was no strength left in him. His radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and he retained no strength. So what does God do a few verses later? And he said to Daniel, O man, greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. See, God will not leave us fearful and lacking strength. He will get us up, not just for this wilty peace that makes us feel good, but a peace that makes us strong, a peace that says, I am secure and strong for God's purposes to continue in his will. This next verse is wild. It's one of only a couple times where I know uh, God is spoken of so explicitly as the God of peace. And it, it's contrasted by something amazing. It says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Now, how could the God of peace crush Satan under your feet? You say, that doesn't make any sense. And that's because a God of peace is concerned when there's something disrupting the peace in those that he loves. A God of peace is going to bring justice, and he can only do so by eradicating all those who do not love peace, starting with the devil. He's going to eradicate sin so that the world will be at complete peace one day under his reign as king. In Isaiah 52, verse 7, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of, the, of him who brings good news and who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. This verse quoted in Romans, I believe, chapter 8, uh, I think so, as it's considering paralleling the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus and his saving grace in our lives with peace and even happiness. This is a gospel of peace. And our ladies are really enjoying their, their study in small group right now with Priscilla Shire, the armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about all the elements of the armor and that the feet are representative of shoes shodden with the gospel of peace. That when we as followers of Jesus walk, we usher in peace wherever we go. We are carrying with us not just some kind of peace, but the gospel of peace. The good news that gives us peace with God so we can gain peace from God. And so when we're on mission, we get filled with a fresh, bold, fiery, passionate peace because we know that when we get on the scene, we're bringing in good news that will set people at peace with a God who deeply loves them and wants to put a peace that will never go away, that no one can ever steal, a supernatural, unbelievable, life-changing peace into their heart. And we know that when we're following God, we walk in peace because he sent us to bring peace to others. That's what it looks like to be people following after Jesus. So third today, the purpose of peace is manifest in following Jesus as our leader. It's manifest in following Jesus as our leader. We want to rest in Christ as our Savior. He saved me from my sins. He has made me right with God. We want to listen to Jesus as our Lord. 
He's ruling our thoughts and our actions. He's helping us live different than we used to. But we also want to follow Jesus as our leader. Jesus is in motion. And we want to be following him. You see, peace can seem like an end in itself. But it is not. Peace is meant to lead us into perfection. And God himself has said that for there to be peace, there must be no war. If there was no sin, there would be no war. That is why God is referenced as the God of peace in the same verse, declaring his victory over sin forever. And the war we're speaking of is not the one in Ukraine. This is a war in our heart. It is a war for Christ to rule. For if Christ will rule in our heart today... We will have peace, an amazing, life-defining peace. So let's get back into John 14 and see why that's the case today. In verse 12, this is what it says. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name... This I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. I will do it. What an amazing word. So Jesus says three things here. He says in verse 12, I'm leaving. I'm going back to the Father. Now he says that those who believe him will do the works that he did while on earth and even greater. And of course, we're not going to, unless you've raised the dead lately or, or, you know, made a bunch of uh, multiplied fish, uh, you know, or or bread or some other crazy stuff like that, you're not going to do anything greater than him as far from the work. So what does this verse mean? It means that the cumulative effect of all of us working together are going to do greater works than Jesus did. He only had three years and he left us to finish the mission. And then he says, he shifts the focus to prayer and says, whatever his followers ask for in his name, they shall receive. So I have a secondary text for this third level from just a couple chapters later, John 16, Once again, Jesus says, I'm leaving. And all the disciples were sad. Sorrow filled their heart, it says. And so he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, <coughs> I have overcome the world. You see, the disciples wouldn't have been sad when Jesus said he was leaving if they didn't know what they would be missing when Jesus left. Jesus wouldn't have promised peace if he didn't know that when his presence left, that would be the thing that they were missing the most. He knew they would need peace. And so he promised that we would receive that. See, we gain the purpose of peace by following Jesus as our leader. That's how we gain the purpose of peace. Following him as leader. In every little moment that we're watching where he's going, who he's taking peace to, what situation he's sensing that good news needs to be brought into. And he asks us to be a part of this mission with him. We are the ushers of peace peace. We are the the ones who bring that in to the world of chaos. You see, as leader, Christ guides us into supernatural assignments to extend peace. That's what he does. He guides us into supernatural assignments. I wonder what assignments he has for us this week. I hope you do too. I believe he has a unique mission for each of us. In other words, if Jesus leads, you're going to bring peace with you into others. That's the end of the sermon. Now, some of you know I like to write songs. I don't write poems a lot, but I wrote a poem this week. I know it's a little unconventional, but I wrote a poem because I felt like as I studied, God was curating what he was teaching me, and I wanted to put it into a slightly more memorable form. I hope it blesses you today as you think about (coughs) what God has for you, what kind of peace he has for you. And so I called this poem Peace redefined. You see, peace is not the presence of perfect circumstances. It's a consistent calm in the midst of chaos in the masses. Peace is not resolution in all anxieties. It is trusting God in all his sovereignty. 
Peace is not the lack of worry. It is a trust in spite of many uncertainties. Peace is not the antidote to anxiety. It is our state of being and our new identity. Peace is not a recitation of platitudes. It is a God-focused attitude of daily gratitude. Peace is not just the lack of war. It is rescuing people from hell's door. Peace is not a feeling, not a meme, not a mood. Peace is knowing Jesus and the grace he's given you. So Jesus, we love you and we thank you that you are filling our hearts with peace. We pray, God, that peace from you would be as a result of having peace with you. We pray for anyone listening to this right now, God, that is not 100% sure they have peace with you Would they make a commitment today, God? Would they reach out to us that they could know today that they have peace with you? And that, Lord, as a result of that, we would all walk in peace from you. And we wouldn't just walk in peace from you, but that we would grow in peace from you as our lives line up with what a life of peace should look like, a life after your own heart, a life resembling your son, Jesus. And would it not just be that we would grow and and swell up with peace, God, but that we would flow out and extend that peace to the world, that we would see your supernatural assignments for us, God, and that we so filled with peace from being close to your presence that we would take that peace into a world of chaos, that we would send that peace by your gospel news with feet ready to carry your peace everywhere, that we would take it boldly and passionately everywhere, God, that you want us to go, that this peace would define our lives, but also define our conversations. It would define our relationships, and it would change the world, God, that you would change the world through a people filled with peace. This is our prayer. In your name, the God of peace, we pray. Jesus' name, amen.